Greetings. Uh, Welcome to the Magnifying Glass podcast. I am your host, Carly Wood. Today, I will be interviewing Dr. Stefan Dolgert, who is a political science professor from Brock University. He focuses chiefly on political theory, democratic theory, and animal rights theory. He received his PhD from Duke University. And for this episode, today we'll be focusing on the ongoing Niagara-on-the-Lake horse carriage debate. Um, There are opposing sides on if the horse carriages in Niagara-on-the-Lake should be uh, utilized or not for the township of Niagara-on-the-Lake. There's a a lot of protesters and people that are against the use of uh, horses or the horse carriages as entertainment and heritage purposes overall. And I think it's interesting to delve into this debate just in terms of um, a municipal level perspective and local government perspective and city perspective overall and and why it's significant for the people of Niagara on the Lake um, and, and why there are protesters that are against it. So hopefully this will be an entertaining um, interview and talk. I I think you're into political theory and and up through the through um, animal studies or animal rights. Um, I'm interested in looking at uh, the debate on Niagara on the Lake with the um, horse carriages. Um, There's just two opposing sides. It's just been going on for a very long time. There's Mm -hmm. a huge uh, wave of protesters support that do not want the horses to be used for entertainment at all um right it they especially during the summer when it's hot and uh, they can overheat easily um right obviously the horses i imagine they don't want to be there for you know the city's entertainment um right i don't i don't know if they're treated that well um with the, the company that owns them i'm it's just it's just an interesting local debate i'm into like municipal politics so i thought it'd mm-hmm. be interesting to dive into this and hear the political theory aspect of it um niagara on the lake is a very old you know traditional city it kind of has like a british atmosphere to it so i think that's why they kind of like having horse carriages there it's a lot of the people there admire it it helps the tourism and all that so right right yeah yeah Yeah. okay yeah Yeah. well uh yeah so go ahead and um i'm 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 ready to go whenever yeah so what are your uh first and foremost what are your thoughts on the overall like the horse carriages is it a negative thing is it a positive thing does it depend on how you look at it Uh, well uh, yeah i mean it's it's it very much does depend on how you look at it and yeah. what um, what philosophical and political preconceptions you bring to the question. Um, so I right. mean, for me personally, I do think that it's a practice that should not continue. Um, but given that I'm someone who uh, uh, has studied uh, in the field of critical animal studies uh, for many years, um, it's not surprising that, that I would say that. Um, but there are, you know, there are a number of just basic concerns about the practice, um, as I'm, as I'm sure, you know, um, one is there's just a basic safety issue in, in terms of having, um, in, you know, busy urban areas, having horses, horse-drawn carriages there. Um, this is frequently, frequently there are car accidents, um, you know, and maybe not that often in Niagara on the lake, depending on how much traffic is actually going on there. But in places where you have horse-drawn carriages, you have frequent accidents um, because they're just not, you know, well, first of all, drivers get into accidents with uh, with other um you know, motor vehicles, but also horse-drawn carriages don't behave like other motor vehicles. And so, right. you know, sometimes that creates um, additional problems. So it's, there's a safety issue for humans involved. Um, there's also a safety issue then for the horses that are being injured in these accidents. 
And then there are all the health and safety issues that relate to the horses themselves, the way that they're being treated. Um, there are very few regulations in terms of how the horses, like how much time the horses get to rest or, you know, how, right. how, how, how they're uh, fed and, and watered or in, um, you know, warm weather or in extremely cold weather. Um, you know, it's very, very difficult, especially in the, in the summertime uh, for, for these horses. Um, and, and horses occasionally collapse and will sometimes die, you know, uh, amidst this, um, you know, then there are, uh, in addition, I guess there are health issues around just the, the horses, um, the way they're shod and the, the damage it does to their, you know, to their hooves, um, you know, being on pavement all the time. That's not something that, you know, horses are, um, you know, naturally made for. Um, you know, okay. road, roads are made for cars. They're, they're not made for horses. Um, so that's an additional, you know, hazard for them. And then of course, on top of that, there is the kind of larger issue of just the, the way that the horses have to be forced to do this, right. The way that they have to be yes. trained, uh, which means sometimes forcefully, um, pushed into this kind of activity and then, you know, not allowed to do what they would otherwise normally do, you know, during a day. I mean, they, they have to do these long work days where they're at the behest of their, you know, their human masters. Yes. Um, and <laughs> so, yeah, so they're, they're human concerns, you know, purely about, you know, the, the safety of cities, but then, you know, most of the concerns have to do with the um, ethics and politics of how we treat animals and especially horses who are very intelligent, whom, you know, there's a long tradition of, especially in um, kind of the English speaking world, you know, going back to the, you know, history of medieval England, of associating horses with traits of nobility and courage um, from the connection between horses and the aristocracy. Um, so there's I didn't a, know that. There's a long yeah. tradition of thinking about horses as, as um, you know, not just smart, but also courageous, uh, loyal animals. And so then it, there's a particular concern about subjecting these animals who are um, kind of by tradition, but also how most people think of horses in, you know, Canadian culture. Most people have a fairly good opinion of them as kind of smart and important um, animals with, you know, with, with a number of good qualities in, in terms of relationships with humans. Um, so all of that then adds into the concerns about what's being done to uh, the horses. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think another interesting aspect is that um, it, it's like it, like traditionally back then, like we, we relied on, like our ancestors relied on horses and as a means of transportation. It's like invention of cars weren't created yet, so they didn't really have a choice. But now we, we can kind of decide and choose that. I know it's it's not like the Calgary Stampede or like polo racing or something very like um, uh, harmful for the horses, like just in terms like something like the Calgary Stampede, but it's still a debatable issue because it is for entertainment purposes alone. So. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah it's, the, the concern from animal <laughs> ethics advocates is that this is purely a luxury activity there's no yes. need to you it, it's not a thousand years ago so there is no need when you know visiting the wineries in niagara on the lake and you know getting getting your taste of old british culture there's no need yeah. for this you can get around in a, a bunch of other different ways that would be safer and that also would then avoid the the problems of cruelty to these animals um there's also an additional, and, and so I can go into in a minute, I, if you want, I can go into a couple of the kind of uh, philosophical frameworks that uh, that would lead in a couple of different directions in terms of how to think about. It. So kind of laying out the complexity of the issue from a couple of different perspectives. Um, oh, yeah, sure. But with the horses, um, there's also the concern that, you know, these horses, essentially when they're when they're done, uh, when, when they're no longer able to be useful in terms of pulling these carriages, some of the time they will then be sold to, um, to, uh, slaughter, basically slaughterhouses abroad. So, um, there is a, a trade in, uh, horse meat. And so 
these yeah. courses will it, it, it's not a guarantee that all of, that that's what's going to be done with all of them but some of them will end up being sent to um asia usually um oh, so I they're not killed that. they're not killed in canada but they will be sent live across the ocean and then and then killed for uh for human consumption uh, so that's do also mean, do you mean yep. specifically the, the horses in niagara on the lake or all horses in canada or north america it, for it, it's a it's a possibility yeah. for any horse yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not saying anything specifically yeah. about like i i don't know exactly what's yeah. happening with these horses uh when okay. they're done but certainly some of them who are in the horse and carriage trade when their time is up will uh be set, sold for slaughter uh and okay. again that won't be done in canada it will be done abroad um okay or i i should say i don't think uh, actually i guess it is possible that it that it could be done in canada but it um but maybe in quebec but I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. And I, yeah, I don't want anyone, um, if someone hears this, who is with uh, one of the local companies, um, that yeah. uh, is doing carriage and they say, no, no, we don't do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm not making any specific allegation that anyone does. I'm just saying this is, right. this is something that does happen with, um, a horse and carriage, uh, trade in general. Um, and I didn't know that. Yeah, it's it, yeah. It, it so it's it, it does complicate the issue and it's it's one of those kind of downstream kind of cruelties that are a part of the practice that are not you know front and center because mainly it doesn't look right. like the horses are being abused as you were saying uh, abused in the way that you might see an animal uh, suffering at the Calgary Stampede, right. um, but it is something that may happen you know behind our back so to speak. You, you never know, uh, just behind the closed doors or stable that in terms of the treatment and just, and not only that, but I don't know, they, they have horse carriages in the winter or if it's just the spring or summer, but the weather, like extreme weather that does affect the horses, um, right. livelihood and their comfort and everything like that. Right. And, and of course, we, we know of many, many cities in Canada and across the world that have banned the practice for exactly this reason. I mean, they, uh, Montreal and Toronto banned the practice. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. that that they've already been, you know, other cities have already said, yes, this is just um, this yeah. is just a practice that we don't think should be going on. Um, right. And in Victoria, British Columbia, where also the, it's a very popular uh, tourist activity, there is also a very strong opposition um, to, um, you know, to horse and carriage uh, operations. Uh, it hasn't yet, yet been banned, but that's one of the places where okay. there's a very um, active uh, group uh, of, of, of activists who are trying to shut down the practice. Um, okay. So... I, I guess so would it be helpful to to lay out some of the kind of ph philosophical background at this point yeah or i don't know if, you, if there's anything to touch on like on property rights or just the autonomy of animals or it's not my field so it, it, yeah well so it's it, that's that really your your uh question actually gets to the heart of what i was going to talk about which is yeah. that in in terms of how um, non-human animals are treated. There are two basic categories okay. for how people think they ought to be considered. Uh, and the basic question is, are they property or are they persons? Um, yeah. cause this in, in, uh, in law in Canada, this is true in the United States. It's true in, in really most countries. Y you basically have these two categories. You have the category of property, uh, and you can have the category of persons and and it's like a mutually exclusive um, dichotomy, right? So right. if you're a person, it means you have certain uh, autonomy rights, so just as you were saying. It means there are certain things that can't be done to you uh, no matter what. It, there, are, there are all kinds of limitations as to what the state uh, is allowed to do to uh, someone who is a person. And that is basically different from being a uh, uh, under the condition of being a thing, which is to be property. And so property um, is, as a category, can be owned by persons, but there are far, far fewer protections on what can be done to things. Now, there are, there are um, 
restrictions in Canadian law about um, non-human entities. For instance, you just can't go, you know, smashing and destroying things in the middle of the street. Um, so, right. there, you know, there are, there are certain limits on, on what can be done to um, uh, what can be done to property as well. But in right. general, if if you have a person who has an ownership right in property, they're allowed to do lots of different kinds of things to that property. And generally the property um, has no recourse uh, to, yeah. you know, to this treatment. And so, of course, this classically uh, in, you know, the United States, but in the British Empire, you had persons, what persons whom we now know to be persons uh, who were enslaved and who were treated as property, right? And so this was the basic uh, kind of violation of their human dignity that their personhood was not recognized. So in terms okay. of non-human, oh, sorry. No, that's very interesting. Like in terms of like at ancient Greece and Rome, it, uh, women and children and certain people were slaves and they couldn't vote. So just, it, I don't know if you should compare that to non-animals. Some, some people do, some people don't. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a that's a good comparison. And yeah. in fact, um, one of the earliest, uh, at least in the 20th century, one of the one of the kind of foundational authors of environmental ethics, uh, a man named Aldo Leopold, um, talks in his um, piece uh, um, called A Sand County Almanac. He talks in this piece about the the um, the way the world was uh, thousands of years ago under the ancient Greeks, it was, and he, he talks about the Odyssey, uh, that is Homer, the epic poem by Homer. And he refers to this one uh, passage in that story. This is the story of uh, the warrior Odysseus and his kind of expedition in the Trojan War, but then his return home. And he comes back home and he finds that uh, a number of his the, the the women who were supposed to be servants in his home have taken up with a group who were trying to usurp his kingship um and so okay. in the poem he just has them strangled uh he has these I, I forget if it's 12 serving women or 20 serving women anyway he just has them all strangled uh, and and hung up uh in his in, uh kind of in his meeting hall um and the way that's treated in the poem is it's as if nothing really happened because they were essentially in the category of property. Right. And so killing them was as, you know, as, as uneventful as, you know, as disposing of some of a sword or a table that you didn't like. And so he just has them killed and it's, it's not even, it's remarked on in the poem, but it's anyway. So yeah, so that's, that's what it's like to be property. Uh, you can have anything done to you and it just doesn't matter basically. Okay. Okay, so um, so basically, you have, you know, in Anglo-American law, animals are property, basically, almost entirely. Um, they're in the category of property, or they're they're things. They're not persons. Um, and so, even even today, where we have um, regulations that are designed to ensure animal welfare. Um, those welfare regulations still, while recognizing that there's something different about non-human animals, right. um, uh, you know, so there are animal, anti-animal cruelty statutes, for instance, um, it recognizes that there's something different about animals, non-human animals than a table, but nevertheless, that it's still essentially a crime against property um to to do something to a non-human animal it's not considered a crime against a person uh and so the penalties are a lot less for animal cruelty and they're very rarely prosecuted so right. even even people who say and the, the kind of mainstream legal order right now is a what we call an, a welfarist order so it it says yes animals should be concerned with animal welfare but that's all still under the category of considering animals property. Okay. Um, so then most of the people who are trying to challenge what's being done to non-human animals today. So this would, this would be the case for the groups that have been protesting against the treatment of these horses in Niagara on the lake right. uh, for many years. Those are, are um, people who think that we should 
no, there's a lot of diversity of opinion in terms of what exactly uh, these activists think. But in general, they think we need to be thinking about non-human animals as persons. That's the basic difference. Yeah. Um, and now there are still different ways of thinking about how we should treat non-human animals, even if we treat them as persons. So mm -hmm. some activists say we actually need to think about non-human animals like horses and dogs uh, and, uh, and, and uh, other domesticated animals. We need to think about them as citizens. So not only are they persons, but they actually should have citizenship rights. Um, and if they don't have those, that they're not really being fully respected. Now, not all the people who are uh, arguing against the current treatment of horses uh, in Niagara on the Lake. Not all of those people would say that. Some of okay. them would just say, "Well, we don't need to. We don't need to make them citizens, uh, right. or we don't need to think about them as citizens. But we do need to think about them as um, autonomous, ethical beings who basically we just we sh just shouldn't be interfering with. So we just we should just be yeah. leaving them alone. So it's not that they should be." thought of as co-citizens in some kind of combined human animal political organization. Okay. But instead we should just be trying to disassociate ourselves as much as possible. Like that we essentially, we cause violence to them. We harm them in, in all kinds of different ways. We're cruel, we're thoughtless. We ought not to treat them as property anymore. And it also means we ought, we ought to try to have as little to do with them as possible because when we essentially when we interfere with them we do them harm so we just need to try to kind of separate ourselves so those kind of advocates who also think we need to think of non-human animals as person but they want to see more of just like a separation like let's let's rewild uh giant areas of the world and that the animals are just going to have their own areas and we're just not even going to have any kind of interaction with them so some some people okay. are more in that view and that's what we call an abolitionist view. Okay. So entirely dissociating humans from non-humans. Some people are again more in this co-citizens view. So we need to be thinking about animals as persons and also as co-citizens and thinking about how to make for better uh, relations between us and you know pigs and dogs and uh, cows, etc., and horses. Um, and that that means we need to think about them as co-citizens. Um, and then there's, uh, so I'll, I'll stop my explanation at this point, but there is another group that says, well, we shouldn't think about them as persons and we shouldn't think about them as property. We ought to think about them as something totally different. Um, okay. And so that, so there's a um, philosopher out at the University of Victoria named Manisha Dekka, uh, a, a legal theorist. And she says, we need to create a new legal category called beingness and that that would, that would, um, and there are some particular reasons she has for saying we need we need just a totally new category. So we need to not try to fit animals into the person's category because it creates too many problems. But we yeah. also don't want to keep animals as property because that allows us to abuse them too much. So anyway, so there's there's a lot of um, theorizing going on out there in in Canada across the world in terms of how to think about and categorize uh, animals so that we can treat them better. That's a good point. I, I think one of the, the problems is that um, with people that do want to use animals for entertainment purposes, many people will say to me or I will read articles is that they, they simply can't tell you they don't want to be involved like the horses or animals. They can't speak. Um, they can't tell you they don't want to be involved in it. So we can just use them as property. But once you do, you can hear that they're in pain or they break their bones or, or limbs or they end up dying. So that just signifies that maybe we shouldn't use them for those purposes overall, even though they don't, they can't give you their consent, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's, yeah, that is something that I hear from time to time. And of course, yeah. it the point ignores all of the ways in in human human relations um that point ignores all of the ways in human human relations that we don't actually rely on explicit consent so for instance there are all kinds of things that you can't do to children that you can't do to you know those who are you know disabled in some way or or who are mm -hmm. elderly who are not able to fully voice in language 
you know, their needs, desires, hopes, etc. But, you know, we recognize that there are all kinds of human beings that can't give, you know, like a detailed verbal description of what they want. Right. But that doesn't mean you no. can do anything you want to them there you know so so the the language thing is i think kind of a uh kind of a red herring uh or it it, it gets us off on the the wrong track be, because we know that there are all kinds of things that you know we can tell from other human beings uh and this is also true for many 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 kinds of non-human animals especially the kind who are domesticated who have been living with human beings for the last twelve thousand years um we know all kinds of things about the things that they like and that they you know and what they don't like and what causes suffering and yeah you don't need you don't need someone typing out you know something in a in a chat to to figure that out exactly i've i've um there's people that i've talked to and debated and they they say well animals can't they don't have a concept of death or or life they can't think philosophically like like humans so we can't put them put them on that that line or spectrum with us but they're still sentient beings they they still have emotions they have feelings they have awareness it, it's just a different type of thinking process than than humans it doesn't mean we should view them as as lesser i think i i'm not a vegan anymore but i i understand like more vegan and animal right protesters are coming from mm -hmm. like, like there's even though they can't speak you know human language that they're they're still like i think persons in a sense yeah 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 it's the the argument about again what you're saying i've i've heard you know numerous times before that um it, something about they don't have a concept of death or they don't have this or that or the other concept and right what you see historically is that people have set up kind of goal posts or guide marks and they would say, well, because animals can't do this, this is why it's okay to treat them in a certain way. So because animals can't speak or because animals can't reason, then it's okay to treat them in a certain way or because animals can't use tools. Okay, so what happens is yes. what we have found, especially over the last 200 years with various kinds of cognitive ethology, so that this is scientists studying animal cognition, um, we found that animals can reason pretty well, you know, different in different ways, but they, they have different um, capacities, but but they they do have forms of rationality. And so then people initially used to say, well, uh, so like 400 years ago, oh, well, animals can't reason, therefore it's okay to treat them uh, however right. we want. And then you have scientists saying, well, actually, they, they can actually reason. And so then people say, oh, well, actually, it's not reason that we care about, it's tool use. No animals can use tools because for a long time it was thought animals can't use tools. Well, we now know that animals can use tools. Bunches of animals use tools. And so we then know say, that. okay, they, they can use tools. And then the response is, oh, well, actually, okay, it wasn't actually tools that were the problem. It's that they don't have a concept of mortality. And so like yeah. the goalposts are constantly moving to just justify us basically being able to abuse them. Um, and yeah. again, I, I go back to, you know, questions of, or concepts of mortality with respect to um, young humans, uh, who, you know, children or humans who are uh, disabled, uh, cognitively disabled in different ways. Does it matter that those, you know, persons do not have a concept of mortality? I, I don't see, I don't see what it matters. Um, no, but, right. But again, it's people, people will use, and again, this is the kind of history of human philosophy, people use whatever rationality they have to basically try to justify them doing things that are in their own selfish interests. So yes. Yes. basically we, we have the thing that we're used to doing that we like doing that we benefit from. Uh, yes. We like the taste of animals. We like to use animals for, you know, entertainment. Uh, it's funny, whatever. And then we just come along with, come up with reasons later to justify the thing that we wanted to do in the first place. And we often yes. don't really care what the actual reasons are. We don't, we don't actually care whether it's good reasoning that we use. We just look for, look for reasons to justify our prejudices, essentially. Exactly. That's, that's very true. A little off tangent. I heard I've been told that elephants can um, 
um, they can bury their loved ones at like, at like a clan and, and they can go back to it years later and they can remember where it is and pay their respects. Like that's a sign of emotional intelligence. It's just to, I just find that very unique and fascinating that certain animals can do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and of course, yeah, I didn't even say that it, it, it seems that some, some kinds of non-human animals actually do have a concept of mortality. Yeah. So, you know, maybe not all, but certainly not all, but, yeah, but some of them, um, you know, killer whales, um, uh, you know, elephants, um, uh, a, a number of others as well do seem to have, you know, some sense of mortality and, um, kind of honor their dead and we'll go, you know, remember them and we'll, you know, we'll return to them. Um, so yeah, so even, yeah, even some animals do have some, you know, concept, but again, you know, the, the, the speciesist, the defender of anthropocentrism, you know, the defender of, of human centrality or human exceptionalism will come up with some other reason for saying, well, that's not really the mortality that I'm talking about. Right. Exactly. Like but of course, that's also the kind of thinking that leads to people from certain religions being willing to kill people from other religions because they say, well, they don't have a real concept of mortality, but that only comes about with my vision of God and my vision of what the afterlife is. And these other people from these other religions who don't have it, you know, if they're Buddhist yes. or Hindu or, you know, or even, you know, differences between Christians and Muslims, they'll say, well, this, this other person shouldn't be respected and actually we can kill them because they don't have a real understanding of what human life is about and a real understanding of what, you know, god is about so it's it's the same kind of reasoning that leads to this you know discrimination against animals that don't have the right you know hardware for appreciating a certain aspect of mortality yeah but very true i i just think it's interesting how different cultures and countries have very different perspectives on how we should treat and perceive animals and in, in terms of their morality or in terms of entertainment purposes or like especially whaling, that's a that's a very cultural thing for I I believe indigenous people in certain Scandinavian countries, but there are certain activists that may have um you know have conflicted views on that. Maybe it does depend on the culture as well. I I'm not sure because like with Nagar on the Lake, to me it's very like traditional kind of British, very elderly old-fashioned style so i think the problem with the niagara on the lake uh carriage debate there is that it's it's just very traditional and old school and it's, it's almost like you can't tamper or like try to challenge their view in a way be, because it's so traditional and 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 a lot of people there don't want that change at all just right. from a, a local perspective yep yeah yeah there, there's yeah. There, there's the combination in the case of Niagara on the Lake, there's the combination of a certain sense of tradition uh, that you've been speaking to, and then the financial interest that is connected to that. Yes. Right. So the idea that yeah. it's, it's, it's the image of tradition that brings people as tourists to this area and yes. that therefore, you know, we want to have as many things that are traditional as possible. And so if the horse and carriages, you know, is like that, then, then we're going to have that. Um, of course, we don't have fox yeah. hunting in the area because that was considered, you know, traditional. Because of, of course, that's gone out of vogue, uh, gone out of fashion. But you know, there, there are all kinds of traditions that you know we recognize yeah. are no longer things that we ought to be doing. You know, that we we come to understand different things about the world and about what is cruel or not cruel. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I, I would say that, that um, the, the, uh, the ingrained prejudice that comes from tradition is, is really yeah. one of the most important things that keeps people from acknowledging the harms that they do, because they, they want, they're attached to a certain vision of their past, or maybe their culture's past. And right. they, and of course, again, and there's financial interests involved in Niagara on the Lake. So, um, so that as well, you know, you also look to kind of where the money, where the money comes from or where the money goes. Um, right. Yeah. 
same along the line with the Calgary Stampede as well, even though that's more harsher. It's just, I just think it's interesting because, you know, there, it is a certain city and a certain place and Niagara on the Lake is, is distinctive. It's kind of different from others. It's just more, you know, upper end class polish. So I just think a lot of the people there are just kind of, um, upset and and angry with these protesters because you're kind of infringing on our city and how we want to lay out the policies and our tourism and and our local culture and heritage so i i just find it interesting how there's just a clash that way I, yeah. yeah i mean i i think a lot of um my sense and i i i don't know so i have to say i've, I've never been involved in any protests or I've, I've never oh, okay. uh, like with with the Niagara well it, we're with horse uh, horse and carriage um, okay. I've never been involved in any activism related to that I mean I you know I'm saying I support uh, I support the activists who are who are opposing it but I've never yeah. been involved in any way but my sense is of of Niagara so I, I know I have some um, connections to some of the people who have been involved in this and my sense is that a lot of them are quite local like I don't think they're they're not like agents being shipped in from Toronto to disrupt no. you know Niagara I think they're like they're in St. Catharines or Niagara Falls or Niagara on the Lake or you know Lincoln or like they're they're from the area yeah. um, and so for them you know they think you know, it's it's their area too, right? And or I mean, right. at least in, in their view, so they're they're just trying to um, to do what's right, but you know, in in a way that they're trying to defend what's local for them as well. Um, exactly. You know, in a similar way to the activists who who went after Marine Land and yes. you know, Marine Land, which uh, you know has been just utterly reprehensible in terms of uh, its treatment of um, uh, I agree. Uh, you know of, of of sea mammals, especially. Um, and again, I, or, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to, to say that I think you can appreciate a, a heritage or a city without animal entertainment. I know it's maybe important for financial um, purposes, like it can help people with the local economy. But at, at the end of the day, it, if, if they are being tortured and the animals aren't giving their consent, and I, I just... It's like a blurry line, I guess. But to me, I think they shouldn't be used for entertainment purposes. Like Niagara on the Lake has a lot of interesting like heritage with the Shaw Festival and the the Prince of Wales Hotel. Like there's just a lot of heritage and culture there that I don't think they need uh, a horse carriage to add on to that image. Yeah. I also yeah. Oh, I, I also wanted to ask: Do you think all animal entertain purposes should be like eradicated or there are certain ones or does it depend on the country or culture you think uh, and I, how they're being treated yeah i mean yeah. so the specifics of treatment do make a difference but in general at least so my you know personal philosophical position is in general that I would say that animals should not be kept for entertainment and okay. that the, the only kind of um, the only kind of interactions there's I guess semi entertainment that I would support are right. in terms of like rescue organizations. So for instance, there's a um, there is a uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. There's a Oh, it's I think it's called the Y Marsh. So W Y E uh, up in um, a little ways north in Ontario, just close to Georgian Bay. And they have okay. a uh, a raptor rescue um, practice there. So they have I, I guess it's not just raptors, but it's uh, large birds. And so they rescue these large birds who have been injured, like hit while, you know, feeding on a carcass in the middle of a road and then like hit by a car or, you know, something like that, but they okay. survive. So they will allow people to come in and view the, some of these birds and to somehow uh, sometimes interact with them. Right. But 
the, what they're trying to do is uh, house the birds until the birds are able to become independent and get essentially rewild them. Yeah. So there, I think the the entertainment is 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 kind of is the secondary purpose. The the purpose is getting the animals back to where they can actually get back in the wild. Yes. But I guess I I think it's probably not terrible if if um you know if the public interacts with these you know birds in some way as long as it's not as long as it's not in any way you know harming the birds and the birds are basically only being kept there to in order to get them back into the wild then right. the public is interacting with them then it's not um it's not interfering with that primary you know primary concern for the for the animal's health um okay. so that kind of thing i i guess i can imagine um continuing or, and and ethically i i don't i don't think that's problematic because again the main concern is the animals are 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 being treated with dignity and respect to try to you know get to get them back to independent living um that's very true i i wanted to ask do you think if if the sides were changed like if, if the horse carriages were like in Nargon lake would would people have a different view or would protesters have a different view or would it not matter where where it is in the municipality do you think uh, sorry i think i'm not understanding the question is so if what what would change if if there were horse carriages in like niagara falls because that's like the biggest tourist industry we have like would protesters have a, uh, a more uh, softer view on that because it's Niagara Falls? Or do you think it, it doesn't matter where it is in the municipality? I, no, I don't think that would make any difference. Okay. I mean, I think, you know, yeah. protesters oppose them in Montreal and in, you know, other cities. Right. Um, even in New York City, for instance, the mayor of New York uh, I think has recently come out against uh, horse horse drawn carriages and th thinks that they should probably be banned now. Um, okay. And, and the, that person that, that's that mayor is not an activist or anything. It's just yeah. he's, he's come to this conclusion. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't think activists would have any different feelings. I mean, I think they would still be opposed to it in pretty much the same way. Because um, the the problem is that the the practice is just not that that is the practice of horse drawn carriages is just not fundamentally different in any place it's it's still going to be bad for sort of auto safety and it's still going right. to be bad for the horses so it doesn't it doesn't really it wouldn't make any difference okay i wasn't sure if, if it would just because niagara falls is bigger and toronto but it it shouldn't make a difference i think because they're still being um not treated fairly i suppose right yeah at yeah. least that's that's my guess for how activists would respond i, I think they would be just as opposed you know yeah. uh, you know as we've seen in all of these other cities where um you know where 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 the practice has been ended or is being currently yeah. challenged do you think of uh, yeah i'm not sure how to frame the question but if if the um the niagara on the lake with the horse carriage is the company if if they do take really good care of the horses and, and maybe they only use them for a limited set of hours and the climate's not too extreme, would that be okay? Or like, it would it just completely no, you think? It's still still harmful in a way. Even well, though I mean, you... yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it would be better for the horses if they had more stringent regulations that protected the, the conditions yeah. of their labor. Um, right, right that they that they have to be you know on a much stricter schedule in terms of how much they can work that they can't work in you know in certain conditions yes so i mean yeah i would say that's better than no the the very limited regulations that exist now right um but i think the for me the practice is still basically not respectful enough of these animals and that it's still basically yeah. just using them for an economic purpose without really being uh interested in their welfare like in their in their real um happiness and okay. so for me i would say even even very very limited work would still be something i would not support although okay. again i would say it's it's better than the current 
you know, than the current conditions. But right. what we've what we have seen time and time again in terms of animal industries. So whether this is um, something like animals in entertainment or whether it's animals as they're being um, raised to be, you know, slaughtered for for human consumption. Yeah. Is industries will always say, uh, hey, you know, give us some regulations. We'll abide by those regulations. We'll, you know, we'll do it the right way. We'll raise them nicely. We'll kill them cleanly and everything right. will be fine. And what we find time and time again is that the industry say that, but in fact, they ignore many of the regulations that are put on them and that the government rarely wants to actually enforce those regulations because it's very, very costly to to actually monitor. Just think about the, the, the costs imposed on municipalities and cities for policing of the human population and then imagine what would be necessary to actually police how animals are being treated in all of the different places that animals uh, are housed you know in ontario in alberta and whatever um, okay. it's very very expensive to do and this is why the provinces don't really do it they they do as little as they possibly can to enforce regulations because it's just costly it's a pain in the neck they don't want to do it yeah so for sure so it's hard to imagine a set of regulations that would actually have teeth that would actually be enforceable because it would require so much money to have people out there actually checking on these businesses to make sure that they were doing things in the way that the regulations say they should do them um i didn't know that so there, there's not much of that implemented in, in terms of the and is that what you mean? And yeah, there th yeah. there are there are some regulations that exist. Again, animals are still considered property; they're right. still considered things in Canada. But there are regulations uh, about cruel and inhumane treatment of yeah. animals. But a the regulations are very minimal, and b even the ones that exist are almost never enforced. Okay. Uh, and when they are enforced, it's oftentimes activists who are sneaking into places and expo and getting on film something that's going on, some really, really, really super cruel violation of the the regulation. Yeah. Um, and that's how that's how it comes out. But th there's very, very little enforcement uh, of, of these rules. Usually industries just say, oh, well, we police ourselves, so it's fine. But, right. Um, the history of capitalism is that industries do not police themselves. Uh, they're, I mean, in any <laughs> for anything, the industries, companies don't want to pay to enforce rules on themselves. The, the, yes. No, no company wants to do that. So, uh, no. and, it's, and it's the same with animal industries. I did not know. That's really good to know, actually. Yeah. So I yeah, also... it's just very yeah very hard to see an effective administration of regulations so yeah sorry please i was gonna say do you think there should be like some kind of like city committee for that like just in turn like happy Wolf is a, a very um i don't know what your views are on that um but like should should like a city have a committee to make sure and monitor like certain animal purposes are okay or i don't know how to frame the question like yeah sure i mean yeah. it, it it depends on where we're talking about i mean yeah yes i think there probably should be municipal committees or commissions yeah i i think so i i i think that would be good the part of the problem is that of course in ontario or in canada more generally you know the old cliche is that the municipalities are the creatures of the provinces, right? So yes. provinces can do whatever, can dissolve municipalities at will. Um, so I would say a really effective regime would have to come from the top. It would have to be provincially, in, su provincially supported and pr provincially right. endorsed and provincially enforced. Um, so it would, it would be a good start to see something at a municipal level, but the province could always override that. And um, so exactly. in order, which is different for, you know, many other countries have much more truly independent municipalities. I mean, not independent, independent in the, in the uh, broadest sense, but at least that there, that there's much more local independence, like for instance, yeah. with an America, an American city or county has a lot more independence than, in you know in the canadian context um okay. 
So that would be a start, but yeah, it, it, in order for it to really be effective, it would have to be something that was coming from the province, which in Ontario, at least at the moment, that's there's no likelihood of that. Okay, so that municip it couldn't be a sovereign thing with the min municipality. You would need consent because of the creature of the province. Um, yeah, you. I mean, <laughs> municipalities could do things. I'm not saying they can't. Right. But if they if they were doing something that eventually ran afoul of what the province wanted, the province could just, you know, essentially force them yeah. to stop it. Um, okay. But uh, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's I think it's a good thing for provinces to take the initiative because that's one way that the province can get information if a bunch of province or sorry, if a bunch of municipalities are doing yeah. these kinds of things, then that might be something that the province would want to actually support or, or take um, take recognition of. Right. You know, again, you have the provinces or sorry, I keep getting mixed up. You have municipalities yeah. that have put a stop to these practices to, you know, Toronto and Montreal have said there will be no horse and carriages here. Right. Right. So you you can do things at the municipal level. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if it depended on the city because Toronto's a lot bigger and has a little more autonomy compared to the Niagara region. It's just in terms of like opting out or opting in on certain animal purposes like that. You know, re yeah, the region, cer certainly the region would, would be also um, involved probably in some way in addition to the municipality, yeah. Well, so I wanted to ask... Um, what are your thoughts on like uh in, t in terms of like um ranches and people that own horses for like um horse pack per horse pack riding purposes like in terms of like horse carriaging is is that something that should be frowned upon you think um so so uh I do think that it's something that should not continue but let me say that there are there are other animal advocates yeah. who who do think that there are more uh who, who do think that with better regulations that we could have um that, that we could have a, a better horse human relationship that still involved horse riding for instance uh as part of i i don't know exactly what you know what as a business, I don't know what they would actually um, allow, but I know that. Um, so there, uh, a professor who used to be at Brock, Kendra Coulter, uh, in labor studies, and she has now moved on to uh, Western University. Um, and, I've heard of her. Yeah, and so yeah. she makes uh, makes arguments for why certain kinds of practices involving horse husbandry um should still be okay but you know if done you know under a you know strict set of guidelines um i don't know the details of the kinds of things that she supports so i don't want to speak for her but right. um but i do know that there are other people who who think that we can talk about interspecies solidarity and yeah uh, and really still caring for non-human animals but yeah. that in the case of horses that that still might allow for certain kinds of um yeah, these kind of hus husbandry, traditional husbandry activity, not the Calgary Stampede kind of activity, yeah. but, you know, the kind of, you know, some of the more, I, I don't know, I think even even some of the things like dressage and other kind of, um, you know, kinds of horseback riding, maybe not horse racing, but some of, some of the other kind of performance um, activities that humans engage in um, with horses. Yeah, because with the ranching, I, it just from what I've seen, it's more quiet. It, it, there's more mobility and 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 um, freedom for horses to like roam. It it's not like they're putting on a big carriage and and people sit on them and it's very heavy. It's just more one on one. It, mm -hmm. it, yeah, I just yeah. find that I find that a little more uh, lenient and and. Um, safer and better than the horse carriage um, perspective i think yeah 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 i I, yeah. I think there are probably better ways of doing that again I, yeah I'm, from what i know i i i would think that kind of thing should probably not continue to exist eventually okay. um but i may be wrong about that so you know yeah yeah i can't think of any more questions if you can um feel free but it's, it's almost been an hour 
Um, yeah, no, I think I've, I think I feel like I've, I, I probably talked too long at, at many points. So I, th no. <laughs> I think I've said my piece though, um, no. such that I can think about this and, uh, yeah, thank you for, for, you know, thinking about these issues, for wanting to talk about them, um, yeah. for letting me ramble a little bit about some of the philosophical perspectives and justifications for horses as persons, horses as property, yeah. horses as some other category. Um, so yeah, so I, I really appreciate that. Thanks. Oh, no, thank you. It's very intriguing to hear from a political science perspective, I think, on this. And, and feel free to share it with the, the rest of the political science um, professors and staff. I'm, I'm hoping if, if your if you're consent, if you like, it might be able to be published through the Brock um, News, um, maybe. Uh, sure. I don't, yeah. I mean, if yeah. That's, yeah, if that works. Yeah. For you and if they're if they're interested yeah sure sure yeah yeah feel free to share it widely i'm trying to get more viewers and stuff so yeah sure sure yeah, yeah well let me yeah let me know when it's when it's ready to go and uh I'll, I'll i'll see what i can do okay thank you so much and have a great day okay thanks all right yeah. have a have a good one cheers